Hello, everyone. Welcome to True Words, a Shingon Buddhist podcast. I'm Andrew. And I'm Reverend Kosho Finch. So, wow. We're on episode 20 now. I know. That means we've been doing this for 20 weeks. That's actually, yeah, that's really amazing. <laughs> uh, so, for this 20th episode, uh, I was thinking that we would do something on um, explaining what esoteric Buddhism is, because Shingon is often described as an esoteric school, but I think there's a lot of misconception as to what that actually means. I would agree, and um, it it makes it seem uh, very aloof. Um, somebody actually described it recently as elitist. I thought that was an interesting uh, <laughs> description, and probably esoteric is not the best um, term to apply to Shingon. Um, I think that comes probably more from a scholarly background when scholars are trying to determine, you know, what are the differences between the different Buddhist schools in terms of their teaching, the core teaching. Um, I always thought it was a bit interesting that, um, you know, there are Shingon temples all over Japan. Um, actually, if, if we look at the state of Hawaii, they're, you know, everywhere. And um, there are people going in and out all of the time and, and engaged in practice. And uh, I don't think anyone would, if you ask them, stop them on the street coming out of the temple. Oh, is this an esoteric temple? They probably frown and, and look, you know, very confused at using that term. Um, so I, I think probably um, we could talk a little bit about maybe where that idea came from, why the term is appended, maybe what's a better term and... Um, you know, what features are in uh, this practice, uh, many of them also shared by Tibetan Buddhism, um, that um, maybe give people that idea. So maybe a good, way to start, good place to start. Sure, yeah. So why don't we start with um, where this label came from, this idea of esoteric um, teaching. And oftentimes I see that equated with being very secretive about the teachings and kind of um, making it very hard to access. Hmm. Well, I, I guess to start off, we can say that um, Shingon, um, just like Tibetan Buddhism, um, Buddhism practice in Mongolia, um, you know, any you know what we would in the modern terms call Vajrayana, are are no different. Um, you know, ninety percent, ninety five percent the same as every other Mahayana Buddhist school. They use the same texts, rely on the same um, Buddhist teaching, um, the same underlying ideas are there. There's no major difference. There's no um, a huge difference um, in, in terms of, obviously, the goal of the practice. We're all um, just different denominations of the same big umbrella of Buddhism. I think what the difference is, is people see um, in terms of practices done, and that's really, I think, where the distinction comes in. Some of the meditation practices are going to be different, um, well, in every school. So every school has its, its particular focus. So what um, often distinguishes, um, so I'll, I'll for a while I'll use this term esoteric just to keep us on track, uh, what often distinguishes the esoteric schools are um, practices that maybe require more explanation or if you look at it from the outside don't appear to be the same as um, many of the other Buddhist practices and so those tend to be uh, mudra uh, mantra visualization so we talked a little bit about uh, mantra in a previous podcast but um, those tend to be practices that outwardly people thought okay that's new or that's different um, when Chingwon was introduced to Japan it required some explanation. It was bringing a new set of teachings um, that had existed in India and in China, but up until that point hadn't been widely disseminated in Japan. So it had to say, you know, why it was different, or you know, what these new these new teachings were. And the founder, <coughs> the founder of Shingon Kukai, <coughs> um, brought that to. Um, the emperor in a text called the Juju Shinron, the, the Ten Levels of Mind. And in that text, sort of laid out um, all of the Buddhist teachings um, from non-Buddhist schools up through all of the existing schools in Japan at that time, um, up to 
Shingon what what made Shingon different. Um, but I think the important thing to look at that text is uh, Shingon doesn't announce a completely different teaching. It announces a new way of looking at the teaching, um, maybe just a slightly different perspective, and introduces practices to help people understand that perspective. But it relies on all of the um, same text, same teachings that all the other Buddhist schools rely on. Um, so it's not as if we don't have the Lotus Sutra or the Avatamsaka Sutra or uh, have many of the same, exactly the same practices. So outwardly, um, when you look at uh, Shingon service or you see practice going on, um, you're going to see a lot of the exactly the same practice. Morning service at a, at a Shingon temple is sutra chanting, um, just like it's, it is at almost every temple in uh, East Asia. So there's not going to be that much uh, different. What, what would be different, of course, um, are some of the attendant practices, some of the training methods. And that's going to be true for uh, Nichiren, Zen schools, um, Pure Land schools. Um, there's going to be some some slight differences here and there. So those are the actual practices that distinguish us. But probably um, when it comes to esoteric is some of those practices are not um, maybe immediately public. I guess that may be a way to say it. <laughs> um, and so, of course, people ask, well, why is this? So some of these practices really require... Um, prerequisites. So I would say, rather than using esoteric, um, there's probably a few more prerequisites before someone understands um, or practices these teachings. And partially it's it's practical. Um, the practices use a lot of symbolism from a variety of texts. They use a lot of ideas from a, a wide variety of, of Buddhist teachings. And if you're not familiar with those Buddhist teachings and not familiar with the ideas and have um, you know a foundation in some other meditation practices, it's going to be incredibly difficult to understand you know what first what you're doing and then second to um, interpret maybe the result of that practice or um, as was my case, um, the, just the amount of, of symbolism and and nuance that's happening. Um, so, give an example. Um, probably, if you're a certain generation, you're familiar with the website uh, Genius or Rap Genius. Uh, so, a rap song may have a lot of uh, meanings in the lyrics that are not immediately evident to certain listeners. Um, and it, the slang terms evolve so quickly that the world needs a website to interpret um, many of the the terms and the jokes and nuance in the music. So I, I would, I'll go out on a limb and say that uh, rap music or hip hop probably uses more slang and kind of hidden meanings um, or, or references than probably a lot of other musical genres. So um, if you're not familiar with those, then you can enjoy the beat. You may enjoy, um, you know, a certain part of the music, but there's going to be a whole level of the song that you may miss. You may miss an entire, you know, be meaning that um, the author of the song is trying to communicate that's not evident unless either you're part of that community or you have someone um, decipher it for you. And I found the same thing to be true for um, a lot of meditations, not just in, uh, in Shingon Buddhism or even when I was studying Tibetan Buddhism, but um, a lot of Buddhist schools have this. There's a tremendous amount of sort of underlying meaning that um, requires study, requires um, you know, attendance at Buddhist lectures. And then when you do the practice, you can say, ah, oh, this is referencing this teaching, this is referencing that teaching. Oh, the, this imagery comes from the Avatamsaka. Oh, that idea comes from the Lotus Sutra. And then the practice becomes useful. Um, otherwise, I think it, it really... Um, probably be very frustrating to um, do the practice and much the same when, especially if I have friends from um, other cultures, when they've uh, listened to rap music, they sometimes look at me and go, I don't, I don't understand anything they're saying or I don't understand what this means um, 
and it, I think in many ways it, it works the, the same way. So there's a little bit of, I guess, uh, maybe what I would say, cluing in that has to happen uh, in order for the practices to be um, understood. And so maybe in the same way that rap music is esoteric, um, Vajrayana practice, um, Shingon Tibetan Buddhist practice can be quote unquote esoteric in this way. Hmm. That's very helpful. So I'm thinking about this. And looking back at our previous episodes, um, a lot of what we talk about is not specific to Shingon. Um, if you were to listen to the podcast, and I didn't introduce it as this is a Shingon Buddhist podcast, it would sound like we're just talking about Buddhism in general. But mm -hmm. really, it's because Shingon is pretty much Buddhism in general. But then, of course, there's added layers of meaning to it. And... Also, I wanted to clarify, because you were talking about um, how we use a lot of the same Buddhist texts as everybody else, but then there are also a few that are unique to Shingo, for example, um, the Dainichikyo or the, um, the Susidi Kara Sutra as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you look at those texts, um, I, again, um, they're not, so they're primarily dealing with practice. Um, so the Mahavarajana Sutra, the Dainichikyo, if you read through, it, it talks a lot about the mudras and mantras of various Buddhas. But these are not all um, entirely new Buddhas, for example. Many, you know, I would say the vast majority are, you're going to find in the Avatamsaka. So um, what you will find, though, is they're talking about their experience. And this is where I think um, we can see a... a, a tremendous difference, I guess, between if we're going to use this term esoteric versus exoteric schools is um, the these sutras talk about the inner experience of the Buddhas. What is it like for them to be enlightened? And that's fascinating. Actually, it's a really interesting read. Um, but the first time I read the text, um, I thought, oh, finally, I have a translation and now I'll understand what Shingon's about. And so this was 20 years ago or more. <laughs> And uh, actually, I remember specifically, it was like 1999, I got the Mahavaratana Sutra in English. And I thought, oh, finally, after all these years of, you know, being very curious about Buddhism and, and Shingo, and I'll have, you know, all the answers in one book. And I read it, um, and, you know, after the second chapter, I thought, I don't understand anything that's in this book. <laughs> and then later on, I came to realize you know, it really relied on a lot of the underlying Buddha sutras and going back and reading those sutras and studying them, then I had a better idea of the ideas um, discussed because it's discussing them from the perspective of um, the Buddha experiencing them. So if we want to maybe make a comparison, one of the, the texts used by um, most every Mahayana Buddha school is the Heart Sutra. And the Heart Sutra is, in many ways, very similar to many of the, um, we'll, we'll use the word, the quote-unquote esoteric sutras, because it's discussing um, the experience that uh, Avalokiteshvara, Kanon, Guan Yin is having coming out of meditation. So coming out of meditation and saying, ah, Shariputra, this is what I've, I've realized. And that realization is not one that... Um, we, most of us have had, we haven't had a deep um, experience of emptiness. We probably haven't had a, a deep insight into um, emptiness to the point that it alleviates all of our suffering, where we have no more fear, as the Sutra says. So it often seems puzzling. Everyone you know that I've met who's practiced in, a, especially a Japanese Buddhist tradition, before long has asked me, you know, please explain more about the Heart Sutra. We we receive the Heart Sutra every service. Sometimes I chant the Heart Sutra every day. Can you explain this to me? I still don't understand it. Um, and so I say, well, it has more to do with, you know, the Buddha's actual experience. And so if you think about that, um, you wake up from a dream and you tell someone, oh, I had this really fascinating dream and this was happening and that was happening and you know, I went from the actor to the observer and then back to the actor. And at one point in the dream, I was actor and observer. And they may say, hmm, okay, that's interesting. But they would not have had the same experience that you did. Um, and in many ways, that's one of the problems with every school of Buddhism, 
is we're stuck with words and we still need to practice. So we, no matter what teacher we practice with, they can't give us their attainment. They can't transfer their meditative ability to us. We have to put work in. They can explain to us how we get there. They can explain some of the experiences they've had or, or perspectives that they've gained, but they can't transfer it directly. They can't pour their um, their attainment into us. And a lot of what, I guess, esoteric teaching is, is how do you have that experience? How do you more quickly, um, and when I say quickly, I mean in cosmic time, not, not days or weeks, but <laughs> how do you uh, maybe more efficiently um, have that attainment, have those insights, but they still rely um, on knowledge gained through the study of of Buddhism. There's really no way to um, to get around that. So that's where I would say that you know we can make a comparison here to a college course. You know, there's going to be certain prerequisites if you want to study astrophysics. Um, you know, there's going to be you know, high school and then your undergraduate coursework and um, applying to that major or graduate program and getting in and there's going to be certain prerequisites and just for you to understand the material. So um, I think a lot of Buddhist practice is, is really the same. There's going to be uh, this requirement for prerequisites, not only in your, your personal practice, but also in study. Um, and that doesn't make it secret. Um, you could go out and tell somebody everything and they just won't understand it. Um, actually, I had this happen recently. Someone um, came to visit the temple here and they had um, been on a business trip in Asia, had, um, through an introduction, <clears throat> um, gone to a special teaching by a particular teacher and had been given this meditation manual. And it wasn't terribly long. It was a bit simplified, maybe about 16 pages or so. And um, was told, you know, you can practice it. And you know, the person who contacted me and said, you know, they had been trying to do the practice, um, but they didn't really understand what the teaching was and had had no luck at all in doing the visualization and asked if I could explain it to them. So they came to visit and I did some, some kind of basic explanation of the text. Um, you know, but I said, you know, it really relies on some other prerequisite med meditation practices and, uh, you know, the person had been very frustrated in you know, a year or so attempting to uh, do a practice that they really didn't have the background to do. Uh, um, they really hadn't had the study and understanding um, in order to really have a knowledge of, of how to uh, approach that teaching. So I gave them a much simpler uh, meditation, the moon disk meditation. And, um, you know, their report back after a few weeks was that they found that much uh much better suited for their level of understanding and, and their meditation ability. And they also found it very challenging. So um, many of the practices really, they build on each other. They rely on um, having done other practices and jumping in, sort of um, maybe seeing something or reading about something and jumping in in the middle. is not that it's secret. Um, it's more that probably will be it'll probably be a disservice um, to go about or maybe a waste of time to go about doing the teaching in this way so if you look at college curriculum you have a syllabus you have a you know we're going to go from point A to point B in this route we're going to study these things and it's designed to give you the knowledge and tools to understand material later and Buddhist teaching is set up in, in much the same way. If you look at you know how the Buddha taught, he didn't start off immediately with um, you know explanation of why compassion was so important or um, you know deeper levels of consciousness. He started off with you know what's the motivation? Why should we do this at all? You know what is the key issue in life? And so he taught the Four Noble Truths, and from that he built on that teaching and took people to. Um, you know, deeper understandings of, of different issues, but it it requires some some foundation, some some prerequisites to be um, accomplished. And I don't think that's different than any um, any school of Buddhism. I've I've 
I guess, been lucky to um, study several traditions, and um, it's not, you don't walk in any temple and say, I want to do a, you know, three-year retreat or 100-day, um, you know, sitting meditation practice. Um, it, it probably was going to require some some level of introduction to those practices and explanation before um, we could expect to, you know, see see results or or even where it's it's healthy for us to do that. Hmm. Yeah, and I think this kind of um, education model is something that's common throughout our lives, Buddhist or not Buddhist, as you were pointing out. And in trying to understand Shingon or any form of Buddhism, really, I think what you were talking about in terms of we are limited by words is very true. And it doesn't necessarily stay within the Buddhist realm, too. Of course, within Buddhism, we can read about theories and concepts, but without actually practicing it, we don't truly understand it. Um, And I had a very interesting experience with this uh, earlier this week when I was trying to explain what jackfruit tasted like. (laughs) On one hand, what jackfruit tasted like, and then on the other hand, what durian tasted like as well. And I was thinking, this is... I can I can kind of describe it. It's kind of well, jackfruit is kind of fruity, but that doesn't really help. Um, it's kind of <laughs> chewy, that doesn't really help either. And it's just the best thing that I could say was just try it. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's something that's very applicable to Buddhist practice. We can talk about um, what it's like to uh, meditate you can say oh this is um these are the attainments that people have gotten to through meditation eventually it'll lead you to enlightenment but unless you actually meditate knowing that won't really help um so it really buddhism is something that you have to stick your hands in and really take the plunge i agree i think um so a better rather than esoteric um you know, the word actually used by Kukai and, and more, um, more more overtly within Shingon in Japan is, is Mikyo. And Mikyo actually means something like mysterious. Um, and it's not, it has more to do with that, that the experience of the practice, the result of the practice is mysterious. Um, it's beyond words. It's beyond our logical mind's ability to explain it. We can't say, well, if you combine, you know, an ounce of this and 50 milliliters of that you'll get this result it's not so analytical um you know when no one can answer for you um you know when will you have this insight well after you know 10 you know classes of sitting meditation for 45 minutes you know definitely that will equal this level of attainment there are so many factors um there are so many you know variables both with regard to each individual person, the uh, nature and quality of their meditation, um, where they meditate. Um, you know, I started off at in temple in Sacramento and oftentimes we're meditating and it's 105 degrees and that's not the same as meditating in the winter. Um, all these things go in to the practice. All these things are dependent on you. I think you can see this too from, um, you know, the Buddhists, all the arhats had different attainments and different skills and things that they were known for. Um, you know, they all studied with the Buddha, yet they all manifested different, um, uh, you know, ways in which they were excellent or in ways in which they, um, you know, excelled at different aspects of the Dharma. And that's mysterious. You know, why? You know, why, why are they different? Why isn't it all the same? Um, and I think that's part of this idea and I think if we think of it more in terms of you know something being mysterious then um, you know I think that's a better a better understanding my grandmother used to always say the Lord works in mysterious ways and you know she meaning she would mean by that some things in our life are beyond our understanding and um, you know maybe God had a better you know had a plan for it or had a had a deeper understanding or just, you know, it was just beyond what we could understand now. And I think in many ways, um, you know, this idea of mystery that um, if we are really interested in the Dharma, if we are really interested in Buddhism, um, there is at some point a realization, and it didn't come 
too long after I started studying, um, just reading the sutras and reading the information and topics revealed in the sutras that there's far more to what I see on a day-to-day basis. There's far more than the experience that I had had thus far in life to um, this realm in which I live and, um, you know, the, the extent of the Buddha's knowledge. Um, so that, to me, is mysterious. Um, I don't have a uh, the same attainment as the Buddha. I don't have the same level of knowledge or insight into people's karma. And so um, the Buddha's knowledge and experience, to me, are mysterious. And when we um, unlock those keys in our consciousness through practice, you know, when exactly those doors open for us is a mystery. Uh, and I think that is a probably a better understanding. Um, Shingon practice is geared, you know, at the, as a goal to um, connect you with the consciousness of various deities, this, this Buddha, this Bodhisattva, to connect you directly with their compassion, basically to plug in, um, maybe to use a electronics idea. Uh, you know, you find a specific USB jack for compassion and you plug into that. So what is the experience of that? Um, n- no way in words can that be explained. So that's mysterious. And that's really where this idea comes from. It's not that the teaching is secret. Um, it's not that, um, you know, as someone said, you know, somehow things are withheld from the public to maintain a priestly class or something along these lines. Um, it's that it does take quite a bit of study. It does take an investment in time, um, but that there are prerequisites. But there's also a requirement on the part of the teacher that they be responsible in giving those practices. So um, there are times when practices are not suitable for certain people, um, just like certain medicine is not suitable for certain patients. Uh, the doctor has to very carefully select based on the needs of the person, what medicine is good for them, and sometimes has to adjust later. Someone has a bad reaction, they have to adjust. Um, This is why certain medication is over-the-counter, certain things you have to go to your doctor for. Um, Certain things are generally safe, other things are, you know, really need to be tailored to the person, and that consideration has to be given. So as a teacher, there's a responsibility, and um, that doesn't make the teaching secret, any more than prescription medication is secret. Um, It just needs to be given to the person at the right time. And unfortunately, I've seen, you know, certain people practice things or um, obtain certain practices and do them and have negative negative reactions. I've seen that happen even with um, teachings that are very open. Some people I know have just started meditating on their own and they'd meditate for hours and, you know, book and be like, I meditate for three hours every morning. That's well, that's good. Um, but oftentimes the, the reaction that they have is not good. It's not healthy for them. Um, and I think anyone who spent time in a, uh, meditation retreat, um, you've probably seen this. People have reactions to the retreat. Uh, things come up. Um, things have to be dealt with. And I think Buddhism, as probably one of the world's earliest schools of psychology, um, is is very similar to this. Um, we're exploring the mind, and as we do so, issues come up, past traumas come up, um, and then what? Right. So if you do a practice that's geared at cleansing your karma, and there's a lot of things to be cleansed, um, there may be new trauma that develops based on that practice. Um, based on retrieving those memories, based on exploring past um, pain. And uh, then what do you do? So if you don't have the full tools toolbox, or you don't know how to use the tools in the toolbox, then you may do yourself more harm than good. So um, to the degree that somebody could say the teaching is secret, I, I don't think that's really the case. It has more to do with... Um, you know, those teachers have gone through an education not so much unlike um, a physician and have some idea of when certain teachings should be given, have some experience as to when they see certain signs in the student um, and are there to guide the student and help them, not to just 
lock up teachings in a vault somewhere. That's not really um, the idea of, of secret when people see that term. So I think it's a bit, a bit misplaced. Hmm. Awesome. Thanks. Um, so now I think we all have a sort of better understanding of esoteric and how it's not something that is necessarily just present in Shingon Buddhism or in Buddhism in general, but really this is something that is shared throughout all aspects of the world, like we were talking about, like in medicine or in education. Um, and really it's not necessarily esoteric as it is mysterious. Um, the teachings, like you were saying, are open, uh, but only for those who uh, are at the point where they need them or that the teachings will benefit them. Um, because in, I kind of think of it as sort of, from an educational standpoint, is this going to motivate the student? Is it going to help the student? Or is it just setting them up for failure? For example, if I were to give um, my younger cousin uh, my calculus textbook, I think that would really <laughs> deter them from staying and continuing in their math education. Whereas if I give them something more appropriate to their level, that's going to help them a lot better, even if um, eventually they're going to get to calculus. Now's not the time, and it's not really appropriate for them right now. I, I think that's a very good um, a very good example. If my teacher had given me... Um, you know, teachings that I learned later as the, you know, first day, it would have been completely overwhelming um, and actually discouraging because I, I wouldn't have understood the symbolism. Um, and, you know, many of these, um, you know, teachings, you know, the transmission of them were days long um, and relied on, you know, a decade or more of, of background and experience. So, um, it's just, again, it's not withheld. Um, it, it's more a matter of people have limited time and who, who is available to put the time in and, um, obtain that teaching. If they are, it's, it's, it's freely available. But again, I, w I would say that, you know, I do know a few people who, um, twist of fate or something have, um, been given sort of a, here here's the teaching and you just do this and this and this and this and this and they go home and they practice it and um, you know, no one has reported to me good results um, either they feel like they're getting nowhere they feel their practice is regressing or they feel that it brought up a lot of issues that they they really didn't know what to do with oh, or they just became discouraged with the Buddhist teaching generally mm -hmm. so it's not um, you know necessarily um, I saw a, um, I have a lot of friends who do long distance running and pretty um, aggressive and uh, intense long distance running, uh, high altitude races and things like this. And somebody uh, posted a, a, a comment that um, their sports um, exercise is your sports punishment. So, you know, if you do football and your practice isn't good and they make you do a lot of push ups or wind sprints, like, that, that's actually my sport. Um, <laughs> So I thought, oh, that's actually, you know, very applicable in many ways to certain Buddhist practices that um, from the outside, people would say, well, why would you want to do that? How is that going to help you, uh, your attainment? Yet there's a certain group of people for whom, um, because of their understanding of the Dharma, um, understand how it will benefit them and look forward to doing it and readily do it. So those aren't suitable for everyone. Um and we need to know when it is suitable. And certain practices, um, you know, I've seen them explained in scholarly texts, and the explanation of them is quite open. But what's not is all the supports and surrounding um, uh, practices that go with it, or the dietary restrictions that are required to do it. Um, you know, if someone there was a online discussion about one of the Shingon uh, meditations, um, the Gumonjiho recitation of um, Akasakarabha's mantra one million times. So if you actually look at the um, time it takes to do it, um, one thing that people don't ask is, well, you know, how long does it actually take to recite the mantra a hundred times, and then a thousand times, and then what is the daily schedule like? So you have to consider your food intake, 
and you know if you need to sit for uh, five six hours straight um, you have to be very careful about how much water you drink <laughs> so there's a lot of instruction um, that probably isn't um, understood initially and then um, you know just thinking about you know long term you know even Zen meditation um, you have to very slowly change your diet so that your body is able to support the practice you want to do uh, otherwise so all of these things there's instructions on but it's not suitable to do outside of a retreat environment you know if you change your diet in those ways you probably won't have enough energy to go about your day um, you probably pass out from you know lack of, of, of nutrition but it is suitable for a very intensive meditation retreat so all of these things you know, through experience, um, you know, Buddhist teaching has that knowledge uh, through trial and error, probably. Um, and and those those instructions are important. But you know, just like running a, a marathon, you don't you don't your doctor doesn't say, oh, you probably need to lose a few pounds, and you say, okay, tomorrow I'm running a marathon. But you have to start training slowly and get ready and get your body ready and um, you know get the right equipment and uh, learn how to train for it and in order to be successful. So a lot of um, you know, there's a tremendous amount of meditation methods dharma practice methods sutra chanting mantra recitation pilgrimage um 84,000 dharma doors right? there's so many practices um and there are a few that really require um special prerequisites special instruction um that maybe are not suitable to everyone in the same way that as you mentioned, uh, I know for a fact calculus is not suitable for me. <laughs> uh, so I, I didn't major in math, so that's okay. Um, but I, I recognize that there are people who really love that major and excel at it, and that's good for them, I say. Um, and I passed the math building on campus and kept going. <laughs> so <laughs> um, that's uh, just, we, we have to be honest with ourselves. But I think somehow when it comes to spiritual practice, um, we've developed an idea, maybe the, the do-it-yourself culture, self-help books, um, we've developed an idea that all practices are suitable for all people, and um, that, you know, we are all different, you know, um, I'm taller than you, so my pants probably won't be suitable for you, <laughs> um, I probably have bigger feet than, well, I definitely have bigger feet than uh, everybody in Japan when I was there, so when I went, they said, oh, you you have to go to Sumo Town to find the proper socks and things like this for your robes. And, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that big, but compared comparatively, I am. Um, so we have to realize that you know we all are different, and um, we have to choose if we want to see be successful in uh, spiritual practice. Um, and again, the practice should be about developing compassion. Um, then we have to choose the. Um, the method that's that's suitable for us, um, not necessarily the one that looks the flashiest. Or, um, you know, we're we're getting rid of things, not not amassing things. Um, we're we're looking into ourselves deeply and looking into our hearts and and seeing you know what are our motivations. And um, the most important teaching for that is the one that going to work the best for us so um in that way i think um you know we have to remove any idea of competition or um you know what will people think of me when they see me doing this practice um that those those considerations need to be removed completely and just um search out a practice that is suitable for us and then really put effort into it so mm -hmm. yeah and that being said, I just wanted to end on the point that no practice is any better than any other practice. Like you were saying, the best practice is the one that's most suitable to the individual. Mm -hmm. So with that, in all of the schools of Buddhism, we can't say that esoteric is better than exoteric or vice versa. Um, they're all valid teachings, they're all valid schools, and uh, in that I think we should all really respect one another and in all of our practices and all of our understandings of Buddhism as well. Absolutely. I don't I don't think there's any place for criticism of any other Buddhist school. Um, all of the Buddhist schools 
uh, are combinations of the Buddhist teaching, but also the people's needs and the culture and our products of their time. And, um, you know, they have sustained and helped develop, um, you know, great cultures of the world. So I don't see where there's a place for, for criticism. I think we just have to be honest with, you know, what do we need? What's helpful to us? Um, and, you know, we live in a wonderful time where all of these traditions are available, especially in Western countries. Um, we're not limited. So we have the ability to, you know, really find the teaching that, that works well for us. And it could work well for us for a variety of reasons. You know, we may have a lot of friends in that school so that it works because we have community or, um, there may be more teaching in our language. So it works well for us. So, um, yeah, definitely, definitely no criticism. Mm hmm. All right. Uh, was there anything else that you wanted to add for this episode? Uh, just, uh, I, you know, I often see, I know that there are not a tremendous number of Shingon temples or, or teachers outside of Japan, um, but we do have temples. Um, the door is open. I encourage people to uh, attend, see construction. Um, it, it, you may not get everything that you're looking for on day one, but um, you know a lot of the temples, especially here in the Pacific Northwest, have regular meditation classes, and um, there's a tremendous capability to learn more and practice more. Um, it just really depends on uh, people's efforts. So I, I just encourage uh, if people are interested to ex- expend a little bit of effort, and um, you know I, I guarantee it will be reciprocated by those teachers and uh, those temples. And of course, um, for those who don't live near a Shingon temple, I think finding some local Buddhist community is very helpful as well, because in the end, some practice is better than no practice. And even if um, if you're listening to this and you're thinking that in the future you really want to find and go to a Shingon temple, if that's not available right now, just I would encourage you to make use of what you have until those conditions present themselves. Absolutely. I, I was very interested in Qinggong um, at an early age, and it was not available, so I practiced in uh, the Zen and Tibetan traditions because those were the centers that were uh, near and available to me, and um, I put effort into that practice, and it was not wasted effort at all. So um, the Dharma is, you know, we're when we're parsing out schools, we're talking about, you know, small percentage differences. Uh, the core is, you know, relies on the same texts and the same teachings. So it's uh, never a waste of time. So um, definitely um, some practice is better than no practice, for sure. Oh, yeah. When you transfer from Buddhist school to Buddhist school, all of your credits go with you. So Yes, <laughs> fully transferable. <laughs> all right. Um, shall we end the episode today? Sure. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. No, oh, Thank you, Sensei.